Greetings ladies and managers and welcome to this latest narration of the web series The Survivor Becomes a Dungeon. If you're new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below in the description. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 119, Vidmori Point of View. The Rat Snakes, the Titan Boa Rats? <clears throat> How about I just call them Borats? Nobody here should have anything to say about a name like that. Anyways... With the surprise appearance of the Borats, I suddenly am flush with a fresh batch and what can be earnestly described as monsters that I'm not entirely sure what to do with. They're a bit odd to look at due to their fur-covered serpentine body, yet they're almost endearing in a way with their wide eyes and big ears. They also all bore the marks of my bond, having a green diamond shape on their foreheads instead of a ring around their ear or shoulder. I wasn't sure if it was odd or just since the only ones to have this style of mark were reptiles like Uru and Zasita. I really should have taken some time to explore the whys and or hows of the mark of my influence. Maybe it's different from each dungeon. I should check on with the spiders and always to see if there is a variety of what sorts of marks they can have and where they are on them. Regardless, while Uru and I were both taken aback by surprise by the appearance of Borats, Brisby was ecstatic upon seeing them. I'm not sure how it works or what exactly happened, but according to Frisby, despite their new and unique physical appearance, these four rats are the same rats from our old brood, with the same minds and souls. Like Frisby, the four rats lack the memories of their lives they had during their service under Lictrin. But what they do remember is that Uruu consuming them all. You should think something like that would make them develop a grudge or at least harbor some kind of ill will towards the person who killed them. But not these critters. Like Frisbee when she first joined us, these Borats idolized Ururu. In their minds, the nonverbal communication, they call him the Great Devourer or the Consumer of All. Since he liberated them of their centuries of starvation with his own hunger by eating them all. The fact that they've been granted bodies with features with their idol only raised their fervor in their adoration of Uruu. They seem to respect me as well, in a way, recognizing me as their new dungeon core and the one who commands both their idol and their brood mother. However, I do get the feeling that they adore and respect Uruu much more than they do me, which I don't mind. By the time the Swarna stopped spinning out Borats, the total headcount came to a rather substantial 34. According to Frisbee, this is just under half of a total brood, which is quite frankly a lot of rats. Well, four rats now. I couldn't help but regard Uruu in a new light after hearing that number. I did get impressions of how hard he had fought, but the idea that he fought off such a massive swarm of ravenous rats all on his own back when he was still an anxious and smaller serpent is rather impressive in its own right. It is no wonder he's been more confident in himself since then. As for just how many boar rats there are scurrying or slithering about, I can't help but wonder why so many were spawned at once. I mean the Fuvimo's spawner only produced eight of these fire thorns when it was first activated. Did it have anything to do with my head feeling more full than usual? So far, that's only been caused by a handler and sponsors. Now that I think about it, I did spot a purple light flash within the crack for a moment. Well, it's not like I'll be able to find an answer anytime soon, and it doesn't appear that any damage was done, so I'll leave the matter to rest for now. With the ball rats now in play, I'd say that I have a considerable force of power built up around my territory. For the time being, they currently surpass Jack's scouts who haven't left for the winter and outnumbered Dianova's squirrels and Lugosi's wolves by headcount alone. As for their combat prowess and effectiveness, I'm not sure how they would hold up on their own, but I have no doubts as to how intimidating they might be if they retained their swarming tactics. It's only now coming to my attention how much I've been neglecting Frisbee since she came into my surface. Considering her background and circumstances, I had chosen to leave her mostly to her own devices while managing my cave greenhouse experiment. I figured that she was content with herself since she asked for nothing and would often spend time with Uruu when she wasn't tending to the greenhouses. But even now, I realized I barely know anything about her and what she was capable of. Today I've learned that she is a skilled and mindful leader, making use of some sort of hive mind connection with some of her brood to guide and instruct half of them on how to tend to the various greenhouse rooms even making sure to stop in with each Borat, where that wasn't sure of themselves and offering a more direct guiding hand. Uh, poor. 
As for the other half, she sent them out from my mountain to explore the forest on their new home so that they could better understand their surroundings, though they didn't ask her nearly as many questions as the ones that are the greenhouse rooms. Regarding her apparent hive mind, I was aware of the fact that the naked mole rats were one of the only mammals in my world to have a functional hive mind and actively serve a queen, but to think that Frisbee, of all of my vassals or scions, was capable of such a feat was surprising, to say the least. Out of sheer curiosity, I tapped into her connection and was surprised by the sheer flow of information that she'd been processing. It felt very much like the direct bonds I have with others, receiving their thoughts at a minimum and being able to share their senses if I were to focus on it. As far as I know, Lugosi, Jack and Dianiva don't have this much of a direct and thorough connection with their subordinates, so it must be unique to Frisbee herself. As for Frisbee in particular, I've come to learn that she has a deep affinity with water and earth magics. She apparently had a focus on the poison and venom paths of water magic, using her affinity with water to make her bite much more deadly. With that in mind, she has been using her magic to actually water the crops this whole time. I, uh, I actually feel rather bad that I completely failed to consider that she would have to water the crops on a regular basis to maintain the greenhouse. If she didn't have the magic available to her, then would she have brought it to my attention, or would she have suffered in silence? I wonder if she thought that I already knew and just trusted my judgment. In regards to her earth magic, she told me it had to do with just being great at digging. I knew rats were good at making burrows, but to think that she would have a connection to it with magic as well. According to her, she had been using it to enrich the dirt and stimulate the growth of the crops, which I didn't even know was a possibility. I am glad that Frisbee is in such a mature and self-sufficient rat. I've been giving her so much space and independence that I may as well have been neglecting her. Since getting some of her brood back, its like a fire has been lit in her heart and she's been that much happier and has an air of confidence that I haven't seen from her before. I'd spent the day finishing the spawners themselves, getting Lugosi, Jack and Dianiva attuned before setting up the cubs with their own individual spawners, just in case. All that was left was Vasti, but she was currently a little preoccupied with stealing someone's identity to set her up with a spawner at this point. Before long, all that was left was to make the statues that I had gotten started with, first finishing up with the coiled Uruu in his serpent form, biting his tail with a stone frisbee resting safely in the center of the coil. Up next was Lugosi, proudly sitting tall with his sword's hilt prominently between his teeth. After him, I prepared a stone jack, the charismatic bird in the midst of his flourishing bow with a cocky look in his face despite only having a beak. Finally, I made up a statue featuring Basti and the cubs all together in a single pedestal. Basti sitting tall and looking rather regal, while the statues representing her cubs play at her feet. All that's left are the statues of Pratimus and Dianiba. But I hold off on making ones for them now, after all. I don't feel like I know them well enough to portray them accurately enough for the statue. As I'm setting up twin stone sconces around this alcove in the spawner room, setting up a ball of self-sustaining light in each one, I'm hit with a distinct wave of mana. It wasn't all that much, but it was different from the usual ambient mana that was my reserves topped off. Focusing on the flow as best I can, I can feel the mana building up as a little more than what I received is taken back with it before heading for the spawner tree in its alcove. I kept an eye on the tree for now, but went back to what I was doing. I guess one of the Fovimo just was just killed and is slowly being spawned again. A good ten minutes go by as I finish the lighting of the spawner room when I feel the shift in the air as a hoof emerges from a crack in the tree. One of the nameless Fovimo stumble out before shaking itself, looking rather cheerful despite being recently killed. Hey there, little one. Are you alright? I ask while making my way over to him, reaching out and gently patting his head as they look up to me and lean into my touch. He doesn't verbally respond, but I get the impression that they're rather happy considering the circumstances. He was playing with one of the people from Haven, and they caught him after giving them a good chase. I could tell that he was planning on not letting them catch him so easily next time. Yet, Pratimus already told them to not make it too hard on the people, because they need to catch the Fovuma for the sake of their futures. As he thinks more on it, and while still nuzzling my hand, I get the feeling that he doesn't want Pratimus to know what they were thinking suddenly feeling more than a little mischievous that his grey tail waggles with delight. 
I smiled a little as I chuckled at their rapid-fire thoughts and unfiltered cheer. Sure, I'll keep it to myself. Run along then, I suggest to him before putting away. I could tell that he was vaguely disappointed. The petting had stopped, but he quickly made his way out, pronking with playful delight as he made his way down the hall. Following the fawn out, I'm greeted with the morning sun just barely cresting the horizon. I must have really lost track of time if I didn't realize that yesterday had even ended until now. Well, at least I managed to keep myself busy, which is always a plus. As I'm contemplating what I should do for the day, I suddenly remember that I am technically had an assignment that I never reported back on. With that in mind, I suppose I should spend some time around the haven today. A quick jog down the mountain and through the woods and I find myself in the clearing soon enough. The sun was still barely cresting over the horizon as I entered the clearing and the haven was mostly quiet for the moment. There were a dozen people going here and there, a couple hunters getting some kills at the edge of the clearing behind the longhouse whilst a few others were collecting baskets and discussing what part of the forest they should try foraging around. A few people greet me with a polite air around them, and I could tell that while they generally consider me an oddity, they at least appreciated what I've done. That's fine by me at the end of the day. I don't need people to like me for me to help them. Making my way inside the longhouse, I spot Luna, Remy, Mina, and Heftio working around the kitchen. I could smell the scent of dough for some kind of bread, a dry rub of herbs on uncooked meats, and fresh fruits that were perhaps crushed or cut. Making my way over, but not making myself known just yet, I watch as Remy and Mina work side by side, talking about this and that. I was more than satisfied to see that Mina was blossoming around the others of the haven, becoming sincerely more cheerful and animated. While I may not have absorbed her memories, I had seen some of what she endured through Rita's perspective, and it was never pretty. Remy is a good young man, a uh, rat, He's a good person, as far as I've seen, and I can tell that he's got feelings for Mina, and she has feelings for him. Looking to the other end of the kitchen, Luna was kneading some dough, wearing some gloves that went up past her forearm while talking with Heftio, who sat on the counter nearby. She was sincerely instructing him on how to prepare bread, showing him how to knead the dough and flour when it was necessary. Heftio, for his part, was following the kneading motions with his paws and kneading the counter while intently watching Luna's hands. His ears perked and clearly listening to what she had to say. Good morning to you all, how's it going today? I call out with a little more cheer than usual, flashing a smile as I made myself known while vaguely relishing in the jolts of surprise that came from their tails and ears. Heftio was the first to act, springing from the counter and scampering over to me as he morouled with delight. He quickly leapt for my legs, his nails digging into the wood to find purchase as he began to scale my body. I helped him the rest of the way, gently grabbing him with both hands as I brought him up to set him on my shoulders, where he perched and settled, nuzzling his fluffy red head into my throat and jawline. It was only then that I noticed my left hand had finally grown back to some point since yesterday. I probably should have paid more attention to when it actually happened but at least I know I can passively repair my limbs if the needs were ever to arise. Good morning, oh great Vidmari, it's good to see you. Do you need another bottle of wine? Mira asked with an enthusiastic reverence, even going so far as to curtsy before looking up with her vibrant pink eyes. I chuckled a bit before shaking my head. No, no, I'm just stopping by for a visit and checking in is all. How's everything going? Do you need anything? I asked, looking at Luna and Remy before looking down to Mina in particular. Mina shakes her head, her round ears wiggling a little as she just offers me a cheerful smile. Hey, you've already done so much for me, Vid Murray. I couldn't possibly ask for more from you. I tilt my head a little, smiling but quirking my brow at that. Oh really? Nothing at all? You of all people could afford to be a little more greedy, Mina. Regardless, if you need anything, please don't hesitate to ask. At that, Mina looked a little bashful but bobbed her head cheerfully as she went back to work. Luna piped up next, scratching her chin against her shoulder for a moment before actually speaking up. If it's not too much trouble, I actually overheard some of the others talking about trying to cross the river to look for more foraging opportunities and maybe set up some more traps. Could you possibly help out with that somehow? The river, huh? I remember that it was supposedly rather deep with a surprising strong undercurrent according to Jack's more aquatic birds. Now that I think about it, 
I got a whole half of forest that only Jack and his birds are able to monitor because of the river in question. Well, I was hoping to help out with more immediate concerns like helping cook breakfast or something, but sure, I'll see what I can do, I mused kindly. Luna flashed a wolfish grin at that but shrugged a bit. I suppose I'll have to keep that in mind the next time you're offering your help. Oh well, she mused in response before looking at Heftio. Come along, cub, your lessons aren't done yet. Heftio did look a little hesitant, glancing between myself and Luna, though after a moment he just gently headbutted my cheek before making his way down my side and hurrying back over to her. With that, I looked to Remy and offered him a bit of a smile as well. And how about you? Do you need anything? His ears flicked thoughtfully as he hummed for a moment, currently scoring shallow cuts into various pieces of meat before looking back at me. I can't think of anything myself, but I certainly appreciate the offer, he said with a bit of a smile before getting back to meal prep. With a simple bob of my head, I look amongst the cooks once more before taking a step back. Well, all right then. I'll go see what I can do about the river then, I say before dismissing myself and making my way out of the longhouse. I could sense movement around the longhouse as the others started to wake, but I figured that I could go deal with this river thing first and come back after breakfast once everyone was a little more awake. Another quick jog through the woods and I came across the small clearing by the riverside. The trees and brush still had signs of fire damage and scorch marks, but all in all, it looked all right as far as I could tell. Approaching the riverside, I decided to take a seat and just listen to the running water for a while. Sure, it was a quiet moment where I'm alone with my thoughts, but, well, I hardly ever got to do this back in my home world after it all went to shit. I forgot just how nice just listening to the sounds of nature could be. Even now, I've hardly taken time to just stop and enjoy my surroundings without feeling the near constant need to be busy and productive. I suppose, at the end of the day, I just need to remind myself that I don't need to do everything all my own anymore. I'm not fighting for survival with every waking moment anymore. And maybe, sometimes I can just allow myself to enjoy a quiet moment and little things without feeling guilty. It isn't long, though, until I feel eyes on me. I don't sense that they're a threat, so I just choose not to acknowledge them just yet and force myself to enjoy the moment for at least a few minutes longer. Isak eventually comes up beside me, sitting by the riverside as well and just taking in the sounds of nature with me. As much as I could appreciate the tact and consideration the teen was having for me, I know that I promised him a talk and it wouldn't be polite to ignore him for too long after he's been this patient. Hey, Isak, what's up? Are you ready for that talk? I asked, looking over at him now and offering a small smile. He met my gaze before suddenly feeling sheepish as he started to rub his neck, though after another quiet moment he bobbed his head once and spoke up. Yeah... I think I'm ready. End of chapter. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azricol. Thank you very much.